George Harrison wrote some wonderful songs, both with and without the Beatles. But in 1976, with his commercial appeal at its lowest point, he was all set to launch the next phase of his career. But Capitol Records had other ideas. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and in this video, we're going to take a look at this album and find out if it's the only George Harrison album you need. For a band that had now officially ceased to be, this was quite a year for the Beatles. March saw the reissue of the entire singles catalogue. The rock and roll music album filled the summer with 60s nostalgia, made even more exciting by the rumours of a reunion concert. And the UK got their first official release of the Magical Mystery Tour album. John was happy at home. Ringo was happy in the bar and Paul was happy on the road. But it wasn't a happy time for George anywhere. In fact, things had reached a point that October where a and the record company who had helped him set up the Dark Horse label in 1974, was suing him for $10 million for reneging on their original agreement, which called for George to deliver them four solo albums. This unwelcome development followed a nasty bout of hepatitis that past summer, which had been exacerbated by his consumption of too much brandy and tequila, a factor which had also ruined his 1974 tour. He was also still smarting from another court case earlier that year, in which he'd been accused of plagiarism. In that case, he'd been accused of copying the chord structure for My Sweet Lord from the song He's So Fine. However, he freely admits in this interview in the NME in December 1976 that the chord changes had actually come from the song Oh Happy Day. In the interview, he explained that the experience, quote, has put me through a period of real bad paranoia, though. Every time I pick up the guitar to play something, I think, uh-oh, this sounds like... I can't help it. I do it all the time now. Oh, yeah, and his wife was about to leave him for one of his best friends. The NME interview found him to be in reflective but optimistic mood. This is an important time for me, he told the paper. I think I need to come around again, like another lap. You know, remember me, folks? I think it's time I talk to people. I haven't really said much for the last couple of years. The end of Apple's contract with the EMI in January 1976 meant that control of the Beatles' catalogue, including all the solo recordings up to that point, of not only George, but John and Ringo too, all reverted to EMI. However, because Paul had re-signed with the EMI-owned Capitol Records in 1975, he remained in full control of his solo recordings. John and Ringo had also been afforded greatest hits compilations in 1975, with Shaved Fish in October and Blast from the Past in December. And because they'd been issued before the end of the Apple contract, and were therefore still technically Apple artists, John and Ringo were able to have a say in both the content and packaging of those albums. However, despite both John and Ringo's personal involvement, neither album sold as well as had been hoped, and have become little more than footnotes in their discographies today. George, meanwhile, was not so lucky with this timing, as he'd been distracted by his work on his final studio album for Apple, Extra Texture. So in early 1976, Capital, realising George was out of contract and legally powerless to stop them, saw their chance to put together a compilation which needed no artist approval, and more importantly, one which would make them the most amount of money. Now for George's best of album, Capital took the unprecedented step of mixing Beatles tracks with solo tracks. Capital played it extremely straight with their track listing and went nowhere near any song which carried a hint of Indian influence and chose the songs they thought would appeal most to the mainstream. Side one was the Beatles side, which kicked off with one of George's finest songs, Something. This was followed by If I Needed Someone, lifted from Rubber Soul in the UK and Yesterday and Today in the US. The opening track of Side 2 on Abbey Road, Here Comes the Sun, was next, 
followed by the opening track from Side One of Revolver, Taxman, a song which had been included on the Rock and Roll Music album a few months earlier. Rubber Soul's Think For Yourself came next, followed by For You Blue from Let It Be. Side One ended strongly with the most popular track from the White Album, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. For reasons unknown, the German pressing on Odeon mysteriously switched the last two tracks on their pressing, although the cover was left unchanged. Side Two was the best of the solo years, which naturally kicked off with My Sweet Lord. This was followed by Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth from the Living in the Material World album, after which came You from Extra Texture. 1971's Bangladesh was track four and appears here in its original single form, which for some is the only real reason to own this album. After that came the title track from the 1974 album Dark Horse, before finishing up with the B-side of My Sweet Lord, What Is Life? At 45 minutes long, the album was at least better value than the 10 tracks on Ringo's compilation, which clocked in at just 30 minutes. Growing up in the UK, this is the album as I remember seeing it in the shops, showing a reasonably happy-looking George perched on the front of an American hot rod. The thick card inner sleeve shows a photo of George taken by Michael Putland on the beach at Cannes, while attending an industry festival there in January 1976. The other side of the inner showcases his solo albums along with their tracks. Whereas John's album had the mysterious title of Shaved Fish, and Ringo had the playful Blast From Your Past, Capital didn't bother with a special title for George's, and the American cover art was even worse. The man responsible for this hideous design was Capital's art designer Roy Kahara, who had also been responsible for John and Ringo's compilations. For me, this is the worst Beatles-related cover Capital ever came up with. Yes, worse than even rock and roll music. It shows a sad-looking George, atop either a giant middle finger or some kind of Art Deco obelisk suspended in the cosmos. The rear panel shows three phases, or faces of George, either side of the Hare Krishna symbol. The inner sleeve shows a larger, sour-faced George on one side and a younger, happier and very small one on the other, along with a track listing which details from which album each track is taken. The album was released on November the 8th, 1976 on Capitol in the US and on the two EMI Box Parlophone label in the UK on November the 20th. Today, Apple is happy to give way to the likes of the Rolling Stones and Taylor Swift, but back in 1976, they scheduled the release date for this album in the UK a day after the release of George's debut solo album release on his new Dark Horse label, 33 and a third. This was followed a few weeks later by Wings Over America and the debut release in the UK for the Magical Mystery Tour album. Now, as much as George hated this album, it kind of did him a favour, well, in the US anyway, and helped raise both his profile and sales of 33 and a third. But more importantly, it bought him some much needed revenue, so he felt he couldn't complain too much. The album did reasonably well in the States and reached number 31 on the Billboard chart and went gold in February 1977. But it was a different story in the UK, for despite the current Beatles revival, it failed to capture the record by public's imagination. And despite Apple re-releasing My Sweet Lord in a new picture sleeve, the album didn't even make it into the chart. In November 1981, the album, along with rock and roll music and Ringo's Blast from the Past, was downgraded to EMI's budget MFP label, with a redesigned cover which, although pretty cheap looking, is I think still better than the Capitol original. This, along with the other Beatles-related MFP albums, were deleted in 1987. However, it was, along with All Things Must Past, issued on CD by EMI in May 1987, where it became the first appearance on that format for those Beatles tracks, as the albums from which they were taken were not released on CD until August and October that same year. Whilst there are no significant issues with the UK CD, 
the US CD does have noise reduction applied to it across the board. We can illustrate that here in this graph, which shows the introduction to Here Comes the Sun. The spectrograph, or orange area, which measures the strength of frequencies, shows the tape noise here as a kind of orange mist. But as we switch to the US CD, that mist vanishes, because it has been suppressed by noise reduction. As far as the sound quality of the original vinyl pressings go, the capital is easily the worst of the bunch. But don't get me wrong, it's listenable, but compared to the UK first pressing cut at Abbey Road by Nick Webb, it's pretty harsh and lifeless. For me, the best sounding pressing of this album is surprisingly the MFP. Now both sides were recut, especially for this pressing, by the Beatles' original cutting engineer himself, Harry Moss, whose HTM initials appear in the side one runout. It's a much more confident, more authoritative sounding cutting, which for me beats the UK first pressing. The German pressing, by the way, is no great shakes and sounds no better or worse than any of the others. Fortunately, unlike the audiophile pressing of Sgt. Pepper's we looked at last week, copies of this MFP pressing won't break the bank. At the time of recording, there are over 30 copies for sale on Discogs, all of which will cost you less than $30. 1989. In October 1989, George's Dark Horse label released this second best of album called Best of Dark Horse 1976 to 1989. As well as including the successful singles from Cloud Nine, it also included the 1989 single Cheer Down, which was included in the film Lethal Weapon 2. It also carries the only official release of the tracks Poor Little Rich Girl and Cockamamie Business. And despite the inclusion of tracks like I Got My Mind Set On You and When We Was Fab, the album was a commercial flop and charted neither in the US or in the UK. But I think it's definitely an album worth owning. Not just for those two orphan tracks, but it's a nice sounding pressing too, which, like all UK copies at that time, was pressed in Germany. And it's still easy and cheap to find today on most formats. With the track listing selected by Olivia Harrison, along with Close Friends and Family, the 2009 compilation Let It Roll attempted to consolidate both compilations by including all of George's songs that reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100, together with I Got My Mind Set On You, as well as other favourites like What Is Life and All Those Years Ago. It also included three of the Beatles songs, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, Something and Here Comes the Sun but they were not the original studio recordings, but live versions from the Bangladesh concert. This compilation became George's highest charting album in the UK since Living in the Material World in 1973, and went to number nine in the States in 2012. Unlike Paul, George was never a people pleaser, and later on didn't hold back with his criticism of modern pop music. He never cared much about the fashions of the day, and made music on his own terms. While his albums may not be as pleasingly poppy as Paul's, they can satisfy the listener on a deeper, sometimes spiritual level. And as for the answer to my original question, this of course isn't the only George Harrison album you need. As to exactly which ones you do, who am I to say? It's up to you to give them a listen and find out. And that's a journey you will certainly enjoy. But what would your ideal Best of George Harrison compilation look like? If you feel like putting one together, please do so in the comments. I'd love to see it. I do hope you enjoyed this little foray into solo Beatles territory and that you'll join me next time for more Beatles related stories. In the meantime, why not check out our website parlogramauctions.com or our spring store for some newly created merch. It all helps to keep the channel going. But that's all for this time, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.